Coming up on this episode of the Endpoint Zone, we are going to talk to you about uh, what we have announced in the latest round of earnings and our usage numbers. Uh, Brad, we're also going to talk about what we're learning from customers. Yeah, you know, this concept of what's the new normal going to be like as we come out of this crisis, man, have we learned a lot in the last 30 days. Yeah, and we're going to show you some of the very cool new stuff that we've put into Microsoft Endpoint Manager around security and around productivity. I can't wait. Hello and welcome to Endpoint Zone episode 2005 with Brad Anderson. Brad, welcome back. You're not in your home office this week. I'm not. You know, I'm actually coming here from one of my daughter's homes uh, uh, in Utah. Uh, we pa- helped pack them up and put all my Tetris skills to to the, you know to work and moved them down last weekend. And so I'm sitting in one of one of their bedrooms. Um, you know, working kind of like six to six here in Utah, but actually cherishing every moment we have to spend. You know, the last couple of days with uh, you know our daughter. Actually, both of our daughters live on the same street here, uh, and the three grandchildren. So um, yeah. But we're, we're loving it. Now, one of the great part about it, I'm looking out the window here, and I can actually see my development office about a half a mile away. So that poor engineering team, I think, is going to be seeing a little bit more of Brad than they have in the past. Well, that's probably not necessarily a bad thing, is it? Let's be honest. <laughs> the, uh, I think this is one of the nice things about the world that we're now living in. We get to actually, although we're at home a lot more and we are working from home and it's put a lot of brushes on us, it also means that we can see a little bit more of our families, um, although that also puts additional slightly different pressures on us when we uh, see a lot of our families every day but uh, it's a good you know, thing oh my word i have empathy for you know the people who are trying to help their children learn you know so you, you're doing remote work you're doing remote learning uh and oh my word the challenges if you're trying to do that with you know a set of you know uh grade school people or you know or, or kids that are in elementary you know on that on that good side it's been so great the last two months to be able to have you know, be at home and we had, you know, our two grandchildren living with us and in the morning they come walking down the stairs and they're just announcing that they're home, you know, screaming at the top of their lungs, grandma and grandpa, just precious, precious time. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm I'm trying to figure out the, the new normal myself of trying to um, actually do a job I never thought I'd have to do, which is to be a first grade teacher um, during the times <laughs> when, I, when I'm not on video calls. Um, and quite honestly, um, math is kind of tricky. My daughter is doing better multiplications than I am uh, on a regular basis now. So that's a, it's kind of an interesting place to be, trying, thinking back to this kind of stuff. It is a different time, my friend. It really is. It, it's, it's really changed. What are the kind of conversations that you're having at the moment with, um, with customers? I mean, we've just come out of a, um, an earnings cycle, and we should talk about um, what happened last week with, with the announcements that we made as part of earnings probably first. But um, then let's talk about some of the things that we're seeing from customers. Yeah. You know, so first of all, from an earnings perspective, you know, uh, what, what I think is interesting about the earnings perspective is to talk about some of the numbers we gave out in terms of usage. So mm-hmm. at, a, at a high level, like all time record months of every service across the board, whether it be Windows, Teams, Office 365, Microsoft Endpoint Manager, literally record months. You know, so we talked about, you know, now within Teams, which really is the tip of the spear in this modern communication, especially work from anywhere. You mm-hmm. know, we now have over 75 million daily active users. We've had days where we've had 200 million participants in, in calls and, and meetings over, uh, over a day, uh, accounting for 4.1 billion minutes in meetings. And the scale of that from what was in, in, in February until now is just off the chart. I think we talked about in previous times, you know, we're kind of at a steady state of about 300 million minutes per day. And we've had, like I said, you know, months now more than 4.1 billion. So the scale has been unbelievable. Uh, you know, we talked about the fact that now from an EMS perspective, you know, something near and dear to my heart, you know, we, we grew 34% during the last 90 days uh, and um, are now sitting at more than 134 million licenses in the market. I can tell you that what I see inside a Microsoft Endpoint Manager is the number of devices coming into the server more than doubled, or the service more than doubled on a daily basis over the past couple of months. We have record high days, record high weeks of new devices coming in. You know, we've, we had record month in terms of the number of Windows devices that came online. Uh, and think about that for a minute. You know, who would have thought a year ago that we'd say, hey, March 2020 was the record month for the net increase in the number of Windows devices that came online. 
And so, you know, from us, uh, boy, I'll tell you, I feel nothing but gratitude, and I just feel incredibly blessed to have a, a, an opportunity to work like what we do. I, I can work from home. I can be productive from home. I get a chance to work on things I know is helping first responders. I was helping organizations stay productive. And so I really feel like I'm able to contribute, and I feel um, challenged, and, and I know that people around me are not, are not having that same experience. Yeah, I have two brothers. One owns a small business. One works for a small business. And I get a chance to spend a lot of time with our Latinx uh, community here. And boy, is this economic impact having a really uh, significant impact on people's lives. Yeah, it's really tough out there for a lot of people right now. And uh, just looking at the ways that different organizations are coming to us and asking for our help to get them up and running, be it in the healthcare space where they've got some very specific asks there around um security where we see customers in um, just the, the regular information workers trying to get them working from home um, there's been a challenge for some organizations but luckily a lot of our customers have had this really trusted secure platform at which has been their base and i think one of the things that Satya said over time is that um, microsoft is the world's productivity platform and it's really true at this point in time um, but I would add it's it's something even more important than being just the world's productivity platform. We are the world's secure productivity platform. We are trusted by our users, we're trusted by IT, and we respect everyone's privacy and security through this process. And that I think is what's been so influential in the the kind of the growth that we've actually seen. Yeah, one of the, one of the most interesting things for me over the past month has been the conversation that I'm having with CIOs and customers around the globe and what the change that I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Satya said it best on a call that he had yesterday where he said, we have seen two years of um, culture change happen in a two month period. I guess more than two years to be honest. You know, um, I think what we're seeing here is, is what the new normal is gonna look like. You know, this week I had two conversations with customers who told me their go forward strategy is they're gonna tell their, their employee base, you should work home three days a week think about coming into the office two days a week. And if you don't want to come into the office two days a week, it's not necessary. That would have been unheard of in February of 2020. And so here we are, you know, early May and boy, how the world has changed. And, you know, the reliance upon technology, the reliance upon capabilities like are in Microsoft 365 to deliver that secure uh, productivity is, 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 is a key enabler to all of it. And so, you know, the, the most common question that I get right now when I talk with um, leaders is transition a little bit since the last time we recorded. Mm. The last time we recorded a month ago, I was hearing things like, how do I, you know, uh, uh, limit the amount of bandwidth that's being used on my VPN? How do I provision new devices? Well, there's been a lot done on there. Now the, con the conversation I'm having and what every customer is asking me is, what's Microsoft's perspective on what the new normal looks like? Do we have a point of view on when we come out of this crisis and, and how does the world change? How does business change? when we come out. So I'm just kind of get, share with you a couple of things that, you know, in terms of our worldview, uh, and then what I'm hearing from customers. So first of all, our worldview, when do we come out of this? Hmm. Uh, I don't know what the word comes out of this actually even means right now. I think we're looking at a, at a world that has changed so dramatically. It's been interesting. Organizations and leaders have recognized they can be productive from everywhere. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing that we're seeing is the concept of remote everything is just going to be a part of the new normal remote work, remote entertainment, uh, remote uh, learning. And so what we're certainly are working on in the engineering teams across the company is making sure that we understand if there's any gaps, any friction, anything that would slow down people from working everywhere. Um, that's where, and that's what we're trying to address. And it's interesting, the three questions I get is, my leaders are saying, is it as fast as being in the office? Is it as secure as being in the office? And is it as productive? And so those are the measurements I would encourage everybody to think about that's, that's, you know, right now listening to this. Think about the experience your users are having right now as they're working from home. Is it as fast as when they're in the office? Is it as secure, if not more secure, than when they're in their office? And, 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 and can they be as productive? And if not, ask yourself why. Is it things that you need to work on? Is it, is it things that we need to work on? If it's things that we need to work on, please contact us. Let us know what gaps you're seeing. We want to prioritize those things because we think we're going to be in this state for as long as the future that we can see in terms of, people working from home uh, more and more frequently. Yeah, and I think that as people start to be able to be outside of their home and do things as well, their their ability to from anywhere is actually going to be a key enabler for businesses. Um, if they And if you have a company that isn't able to work from anywhere, 
it's going to be really difficult to to attract and retain talent in the right kind of ways. It's going to be very tough, um, which is interesting as we start to see customers come through this conversation. They're moving out of crisis mode into long term adaptation mode. How do we long term service people when they're at home, when they're in the office, when they're in another location? And it is a slightly different set of kind of thinking that they've got to apply to these things. Right? That's right. That's the biggest thing. Remote everything. Remote everything is the first thing. And then the second thing, everyone is organiz- every organization is looking at their operational resiliency. Mm-hmm. You know, they've seen, for example, you know, things shut down so fast in March. Yeah. It seemed like, you know, we, we were there kind of on the 6th or 7th of the March. And then on the 8th or 9th, everybody was home working from home and organizations struggled. You know, we saw a 10 in, a ten X increase in the amount of people working remotely at Microsoft. And because we had already moved to the cloud, we were already in the process of moving everything off of a corporate network and just having everybody attached to a, just to the internet, even when you're in the office. You know, even though we increased by 10 X the number of people working remotely, we only had to increase our uh, VPN bandwidth by one and a half times. So yeah. that's, that's the kind of thing that we've been able to experience as we've seen the changes that we made that were, uh, that we're that we're forward looking, but when I say resiliency in your in your operations and and, and um, in your um, just in all your tools, how many people were able to react that quick to the needs of you know having to work from home? What were the bottlenecks? What were the speed bumps? What were the slowdowns? And those are the things that you should be focused on as you think about what your operational resiliency is and how you improve that going forward. So yeah. work from everywhere. Uh, resiliency of your operations and of your capabilities. And then the, the third thing, obviously, every organization is going to be looking for is how do they minimize costs? And so one of the key things, is, you know, this is super fascinating. I was on two uh, calls this week with organizations that I've worked with for years. And, you know, working with these two organizations for years, you know, we had talked about the cloud and these organizations said, well, hey, we're best of breed. You know, we've got these 50 different products deployed. Mm-hmm. We think we will be able to wire them together. Man, the yeah. tone was so different with both these customers on Tuesday. It was literally a conversation of, boy, we can't get to the Microsoft 365 cloud fast enough. We need to simplify. We need to consolidate. You know, by going to Microsoft 365, we now understand the value uh, and the resiliency and the security that we get in the cloud. It also happens to save us a significant amount of money. And so that was the third thing. So, you know, for me, as I think about the new normal, operational resiliency, promote everything, minimize your costs and consolidate your vendors. Yeah, and I, my conversations have been very much along the along the lines of exactly the same thing. On the cost point of view, I think the, the new world is going to be very, very difficult for CIOs to go to the CFO and justify five-point solutions when one suite can deliver all of that capability in a better way as well, frankly, with, with less operational overhead. Um, and and I, can't help, I, I can't help myself on this one. Why in the world would an organization want to use Slack and Zoom when you could use Teams that does both of them in an integrated way, plus gives you the ability to be able to operate and interact on all your files. I mean, it's it's such a, in my mind, it is such a clear, uh, better solution. Yeah, it really is. It, much the same way as why would you go to um, an Okta and have to pay on a per application basis for SSO? It seems very crazy. And well, that, that brings us to, you know, some of the things that we announced uh, last week. So last week was kind of this spring moment for us. And we rolled out a bunch of new capabilities uh, in Microsoft 365 and WBD. So let's just take two minutes and cover them. Yeah. So new things in, in Windows Virtual Desktop, new things in Microsoft Endpoint Manager and Azure Active Directory, and then uh, uh, a set of new things um, in, um, I just went blank. In uh, EMS. What was that? It's a of EMS. Yes, yes, okay, yeah. exactly. So first of all, let's talk about what's new in uh, Windows Virtual Desktop. Three big things to talk about. The first thing is we dramatically simplified the admin experience. You know, if we're being really honest, the, the previous admin experience with Windows Virtual Desktop was pretty tough to, to get through. If you didn't understand the concepts of Azure, but you did understand BDI, it was still hard for you to get through. So now you've got, you know, a, a much better admin experience built inside of the Azure portal, which just dramatically simplifies. So that's number one. Uh, number two, Windows Virtual Desktop for us is a tier one Azure workload. So we have it running in all of the Azure data centers. And one of the things we've been able to do now is the metadata that is used to operate the, the service. We can now uh, retain and keep that metadata in a specific data center or a geography. So for compliance reasons, if you have to make sure that the metadata stays you know, in a continent, in a country, that's one of the key things that we can do with Teams. And so that helps you with your security and with your compliance. And then the third thing is really important in this everything remote. 
we've, uh, we're enabling what we call, um, uh, uh, um, I'm going to go back and start that again real fast if we can, if that's okay, Cameron. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll come into the third thing. And the third thing that, that we announced with Windows Virtual Desktop is what we call AV Redirect. And what AV Redirect allows us to do is when you're establishing, for example, a video call between two individuals or two devices, rather than having to traverse up to the VDI session, you basically establish a peer-to-peer -peer model then. And so even in a VDI environment, we can ensure that you've got this great experience. And this is one of those really interesting ones because if, if you think about it, in terms of an app like Teams, in a VDI environment, there's a part of it that runs up in the data center, and there's a part of it that runs locally on the device. And so this AV redirect just enables us to ensure that even in a VDI scenario, you have a wonderful voice and, and video experience with WBD. That's pretty cool. And it's really a lot of customers have, have onboarded to WBD over the course of the past few months. It's it's doing phenomenally well. I don't think we're in a position to, to release our, our usage on that, but it's uh, it's pretty cool that we're starting to see such a big update. So what we talked know. about what we talked about on Thursday in our earnings is we saw a three x increase in in the utilization of, of Windows Virtual Desktop, massive, massive growth. And those are all net new customers using it. All right, so let's transition to the next big kind of category of announcements, and that was around work that we're doing in Azure Active Directory Premium and, and Microsoft Endpoint Manager. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is we've now made single sign on and MFA for all SaaS apps just a part of the default license. And so if you have an Azure Active Directory Premium license or subscription, you can now use that to SSO enable all your SaaS apps as well as provide MFA protection for that. That's a big difference from our competition. Our competition in this space wants to charge you on a kind of a per SaaS basis, and it just it stacks up and adds up very, very quickly. So that's the first thing that we announced. The second thing that we announced is the bringing together of the different portals that have been in existence for users to get apps. You know, you've got the, the portal that people have used with Config Manager for years. You've got um, company portal in Intune, and then in AAD, you've had something called My Apps. It was, it was quite confusing. So now what we've done is th those will continue to exist if you want to use those, but we brought all those apps together in the Intune company portal. And so now company portal will give you a view of all your apps, whether they're delivered from Config Manager, from Intune, you know, or from AAD in one place. And so that's a big, big step forward in terms of simplicity for the end user. Yeah, that's going to be something that they're just going to really enjoy having. It's going to make the end user experience so much nicer one place to go to get access to all of their corporate applications on any device that's been managed and has the company portal on it yeah, and the third thing in, in this kind of category is we um we 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 uh, announced what we call and release what we call tenant attach yeah so this is kind of like a step one on the way to co-management um you know back at ignite we showed the experience here where you know you can now manage all of your config manager managed devices through that microsoft endpoint management console up in the Microsoft 365 um, experience. Well, we just made that much simpler to, to be able to use. And the concept here with tenant attach is you're effectively just attaching an Intune tenant to the config manager hierarchy. It literally is just a couple clicks of the mouse. It's not co-management because you're not having to go bring and enroll all the devices. It literally is just an, a pure IT pro administrative task. You attach Intune to config manager. Then you have the chance if you want to, to synchronize all of your config manager devices up into Intune, and then from there you can do take actions on all of your devices independently of where they're managed or where they're being actually managed from in that console. Yeah, I love the fact that Tenant Attach really allows us to apply the cloud intelligence to those config manager devices in a way that we've never been able to do when everything had to be done on premises and customers had to think about scaling their own databases in order to be able to allow the, the data transfer in the right kind of way. So we've taken that problem away from them. We've got the tenant attached model. It allows them to do so much more than they could do um, with uh, with just tenant, uh, configuration manager on its own. It still is a step on that journey to do a fully modern managed device. There, there still may be lots of other things that they're going to need to do over time, but it really is immediate value, which is amazing. Yeah, and so as organizations and, and people have asked me, hey, what's the best path for me to to move to the cloud? The first thing is enable tenant attached. That immediately starts enabling you to be able to use Intune capabilities in conjunction with Config Manager. The next step would be co-management for most customers. And then, you know, you can stay there for as long as you want. We talked about how that could be a destination for you. If you want to move entirely to the cloud, fine. If you want to stay in that co-managed environment for, for, for years, fine. You know, it, it, we are going to enable and support both of them. Now, the, the, the third category I want to talk about that we, we announced last week was 
the productivity scores in preview, and mm -hmm. also the GA of um, what we call the security. Uh, oh gosh, I went blank on that sign. What is it? It's called the security uh, console. And security. security. Yeah. And exactly. There you go. So let, let me talk about the productivity score. Then I think you're going to actually go show productivity score as well as show, show some of the security enhancements. Yeah. So this concept of the productivity score is this concept of helping an organization understand what the experiences that their users are having, you know, on the technology that's being delivered to them. It also is a measurement of, of our users working in modern ways. And so in the latter, our users working in modern ways, customers will call and say, hey, we've moved our customers to Office 365, so now we have the ability to be able to use all the cloud capabilities, but are my users doing it, or do I need to go train them? Mm -hmm. And so one of the core things in this productivity score is we're actually gonna reflect back to you um, in a very, you know, you can take a look at it in an, in an aggregate view, you can take a look at it, for example, in a country view, you can get all the way down to looking at, at an individual view, but you're gonna be able to understand you know, which teams need to need a little bit more training, who's working in modern ways and fully taking advantage of the cloud. And it just helps you to understand how you can progress the whole organization to be more and more productive. That's one side of it. The other side of it is all about understanding how you're doing in terms of the technology experience that your users are having. So over the last six months, I've spoken a lot about the importance of improving the end user experience as IT administrators, as IT pros. With productivity score and what we call the technology experience, we're literally going to give you a view of what your experience is that you're giving to your users. We're going to give you the, the ability to benchmark it against yourself, but you can also benchmark it across the industry. And we're going to show you, for example, hey, the average time it takes for you to boot is two and a half minutes. You know, I like to show my PC that it boots and I'm working in 14 or 15 seconds. But for the first time, organization will have the ability to actually have that view with very specific um, guidance and next best actions that they can take to improve it. So Simon, why don't you go give us a view of the productivity score and then talk about some of the security hassles that we made generally available. Yeah, let's flip over to my um, my demo machine here and we'll take a look. So you can see that I'm here inside of the Endpoint Manager Admin Center and I'm actually inside of the, uh, the Endpoint Analytics view. Um, and this is showing me what my Endpoint Analytics score is. Currently, it's giving me a um, score of 67 and the baseline is 50, so I'm doing pretty well. Um, it's giving me some deeper insights here into my performance startup. My machines are starting up more quickly than the baseline, and my recommended software is better than the baseline. It's all great. Um, looking at my insights and recommendations, it's telling me that I've got a number of devices that are running with uh, with spinning hard drives, and that I can get those updated. It's also telling me that my um, Windows devices aren't actually cloud managed at this point. So again, to what we were mentioning earlier around tenant attach, starts to help me understand what I need there, and it's actually going to boost my score by seven points once we get those devices in tune and rolled. And that's because um, management with Intune is uh, more efficient, particularly in places where we're sending that across um, the internet than other methods are. And then finally, it's telling me that 100% of my devices are not registered with Autopilot. Autopilot is the best way for me to be able to reconfigure and reposition, um, reprovision my devices, particularly in this new world where people are working from home. Um, if I take a look at startup performance here, it'll actually allow me to drill in a little bit and see more details on what's um, what my startup performance is like and what's causing my startup performance to maybe not be quite as great as I'd like it to be. So in this particular case, um, you can see that it's taking quite a long time for my users to get to the sign-in screen um, and then get to the desktops. It's telling me that mainly that's because um, I have uh, devices with spinning disks, so I can make adjustments around that. If I had specific group policy that was slowing me down, it would tell me which group policy objects I need to go and tweak to make those a little better. Um, I can also go and run and um, have a look at the test baseline and see what the test baseline actually um, appears to be and whereabouts I need to provide some attention on my baseline as well. So kind of cool that we're able to show this kind of stuff now for, um, for all of our customers. Um, and so they can start drilling into improving their endpoint performance. The other thing we wanted to show was um, we wanted to show the uh, the endpoint security console, which is also um, just available in preview for our customers. What we've done here is we've been listening to a lot of customer feedback from um, kind of two groups inside of our customers. We've been listening to the feedback from our traditional IT admin base, the folks that look after PCs and mobile devices. And we've been listening to the feedback from the IT security organizations and the CISOs. Been trying to help those organizations talk to each other better. Um, and what we've been seeing through that process is that 
actually from the security side of things in the SOC, there's quite a few things that they need to be able to do that affect the endpoints. They need to be able to pass over remediations for critical vulnerabilities, but also they might have a need to configure antivirus on endpoints as well. Um, and that becomes confusing on the IT admin side because a lot of these settings have been disparated around the uh, the environment. For example, um, configuration of BitLocker is a Windows 10 policy, um, but configuration of Mac OS within a mobile policy place. So we've actually brought all of these things together in one central console. Um, so for example, if we go into um, my all devices view here, what you're going to see is a view of our infrastructure. You're going to see all of the devices um, inside of the infrastructure from um, in, anything that's Intune managed, but we're also going to see anything that's config man managed and anything that's tenant attached. Those are all going to appear um, inside of this one single simple console view. Um, and it's going to give me the compliance status as well. So for example, we can see that um, some of my devices are uh, managed from uh, Intune, some of them are managed from um, Config Manager, some of them are co-managed. We can literally see exactly where they're coming and we can drill into additional information. Um, for example, I can see that Danny's Mac is uh, is not compliant here. I can drill into that um, device information. I can also start to initiate bulk actions from here. So for example, let's say that we have a lot of iOS devices. One of the things we can do is send a, an update out to uh, push notification out to those devices to say, hey, it's time to get those updated to the latest version of iOS. So I might say, update time, uh, update to the latest iOS, and then hit next. Select which devices I want to go and include in this. And in this case, I'm just going to select my um, my iOS devices. Hit select. And then as soon as I go and uh, review this and create the, the policy, hit next. It's going to send that push notification out to all of my devices. And I'm just being able to take that action directly from uh, within the security console. A little further down here, if I go to security tasks, we've shown you these before on the endpoint zone. But these are the tasks that are being sent over from Defender ATP that allow me to uh, go and take action to solve these remediations. So here, for example, um, it's telling me that I need to apply this particular update to Windows 10. Um, the IT uh, security folks have sent me over some details around what I actually need to do here to apply this update. And it's also telling me which devices need to be updated um, to this particular Windows 10 update. So super nice, comes across directly from Defender ATP. We've also built in the ability to control antivirus. So you'll see here I have a Windows Defender configuration, but this is new. I can go in and create um, a, another configuration here for Mac OS. This is cool because if I go and configure antivirus for Mac OS, what it's actually doing is configuring Microsoft Defender Advanced Threat Protection for Mac OS because we now have a Mac OS agent for MDATP. So I go into my configuration provide a, a name, which is called a test for the purposes of this. Provide the, the correct configuration settings here. It's going to pull them in just to defend the ATP settings for a Mac OS. So we'll enable real-time protection. We'll enable cloud-derived protection, sample submission, diagnostic data collection. We'll hit next. We then select the scope tags around the RBAC. We can select which particular devices we want to assign this to, which particular groups. Again, review and create. It's going to put that policy in place very simply across um, the Mac OS devices inside my organization. We've very similarly done the same thing for disk encryption. So for Windows, we have the ability to configure BitLocker for Mac OS. We can configure File Vault, including the ability to escrow the keys from File Vault and to do key rotation. Two of the most common things that you need to do when you're thinking about uh, encryption on endpoints. Same is true of firewall. We can configure the firewall on Mac OS. Um, and what I love about the Mac OS policy creation here is I can go in, select my Mac OS firewall, and I can even go down to the point of selecting, um, put a title in here, go into the point of selecting which particular package files on the Mac OS device are going to be allowed to, um, to talk to anything outside. You just have to go in, click add and do um, the add by allowing or blocking the bundle ID. So very, very granular configuration of the firewall for macOS. Um, again, built directly on feedback that customers have said, we need to be able to do this. 
other things we brought into this same place. Um, endpoint detection and response for Windows, attack service re uh, reduction for Windows, um, account protection for Windows. That's where you go and enable Windows Hello um, so that you can enable or disable the biometric features. And obviously, we've also brought together device compliance and conditional access policy into one central place. So if you're an IT administrator that's managing security or you're a security operations person that's managing uh, endpoint security on devices, this is the one place you need to go and you'll be able to actually configure everything in that one single console. Super, super cool. I, I just love, you know, the endpoint security work that you just showed. And there, there's two things I would just, you know, want to specifically call out to make sure that everybody who's watching and listening to this really, you know, kind of internalize with them. The first thing that we see is in some organizations, the settings that you went through is administered by the uh, endpoint manager. In some organizations, it's done by the SecOps team. Um, and there's and, and, and no two organizations are identically the same. So what we've done is we've now built a common set of property pages, and you can get into that either from the security side or from the management side, but it's a common set of controls. And so you could have, for example, if your organization, if that is set by the security team, you can make sure that they have the rights to set it, but the IT team, if they want to see what it's set to, can see it, but not change it. But it's all one common set of policies with two entry points. The second thing is you showed this on Windows and Mac. But at the RSA conference, you know, a couple of months ago, we announced that we're going to be bringing out um, Defender ATP on other platforms. Yeah. And so, you know, we talked about it coming out of iOS and on Android. And so, you know, you're going to see that same level of in-depth integration between management and security this, these capabilities across Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. And, you know, at Microsoft, we just don't think about uh, management security as being two distinct and separate things. They may have separate roles, but in terms of how they operate, boy, they operate hand in hand. And you see here us actually showing that in the product truth. Yeah, and it's super important for customers. They, they uh, really need a, a lot of simplification in this place because it's been very expensive for them to maintain. Okay. Brad, thank you very much for joining me again for this. I love doing this. Even though we, we're, we're now able to do this from our homes, um, one day we will get back to being able to do this in the studio. I hope you have a fantastic uh, time while you're down there in Utah um, and get to spend lots and lots of time with family. All right. Be safe. Be well. Okay. See you soon, Brad.